I turned it off. There it goes. It works. It's, it's wonderful to be here, and I bring you greetings from my wife, who's my associate pastor. And uh, she got caught in the rain and got this congestion stuff in her lungs. And uh, did she talk like this for this morning? She really wanted to be here because we've heard so much uh, about this church here in particular. I think this one has an association with Brother Koichi Katano. Yeah, but well, I've known Brother Koichi Katano since I got saved in 1970. And uh, I know. <laughs> and I've had him in our church in Iwakuni. Our paths have crossed a number of times. Uh, you mentioned New York City, and uh, uh, we did our a lot. Of, I worked in the New York district, so we spent a lot of time in New York City preaching. There's some fine churches in that city, and they they jump. I don't know where Pastor Kevin got the idea that I like old songs. I don't know where he got that idea. Maybe it's because uh, I'm the second oldest person in the church. We have a little Japanese lady. She's 78, and uh, it's hard keeping up with her. We do have an international church. We've got people from everywhere, and uh, we do enjoy the uh, the the opportunity to work with all the different nationalities in the different places we've been. Um, my wife oversees the Japanese ministry and we have anywhere from 16 to 20 Japanese that attend our services. I, I just for some reason counted them this morning. We had 14. And uh, what's really fun about it is uh, there's a young fellow from Hiroshima that we met, works on the base, that got saved too many, not too many uh, weeks ago and is a a faithful comer to church, and he drives all the way from Hiroshima to there. So we just we we thankful for these opportunities that we've had to to meet and just minister to people of all kinds of different places. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I got invited to go meet with the ministers of the Yamaguchi Prefecture, and there's uh, 34 churches that pastors all come together. And I was I was touched by one thing in particular, and that's the the heart that these pastors have for the Japanese people. And I pray that that our churches would catch that kind of a burden. I, my heart was really moved to be in a room of people that struggled to keep 12 or 15 people going just to, to build the church from that. And then they keep praying with joy on our face, but they're praying for a breakthrough. And I want you to know we, we join that kind of commitment to the Lord. And we want to see the people of God pick up that, that burden for the lost. Um, I'd like you to open your Bibles, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 34. Midori, did you have that bottle? Ah, okay. I had a tooth extracted this week. And uh, my mouth dries out real quick. I want to talk to you this morning about Jesus is not the answer. <clears throat> Father, we look to you this morning and ask your anointing upon the word and our hearts as we receive the word. We ask God that you stir us to greater acts of faith, greater acts of service. As we stand in the midst of so many people that don't know you, Lord, may our hearts share that burden that you have for the lost and anoint us to reach out and touch these lives for Christ. Wherever we go, Lord, let us lift up your name. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our major concern for the body of Christ has become focused on those that Serve God for a while and then seem to drift away. Uh, my wife and I have been in ministry uh, about 35 years. And stop and think. Um, and and it's, it's become a real concern because we've seen so many people that would come and serve God for a while, then they just kind of drift off to someplace else. And the text this afternoon tells me that this has always been a problem for the uh, for God's people. They come and serve for a while, then they drift away and often back to the end of the same old lifestyle that they came out of. 
Uh, this is a real heartbreak in the ministry. It's a frustration beyond comprehension. Comprehension. If you're if you're attempting to build a church and and try to build into somebody's life uh, uh, the the way of Christ, and, and then they just serve for a while, then all of a sudden they're gone doing something else somewhere else, and it's it's very frustrating to experience that. Uh, we have a number of military people from the base there in Iwakuni and we live with the fact that our church changes over every three years we'll go through and everybody that was there three years ago will be gone and we'll have a whole new group and and uh, very few people stay there longer than three years and so we live with the frustration of, of getting started and, and and have to say goodbye to them all the time because you build relationships and and when you get a good foundation, you think about, we're going to build a big church, and, and uh, we need you to pray for us because our sanctuary is full. It only seats 90, and, and uh, we don't need heating. <laughs> we warm it ourselves when we get in there and, and begin to have church. And, and we sing lots of, uh, lots of contemporary songs. You know? <laughs> but I do like the old hymns because the old hymns were written by men and women that had suffered and, and experienced Christ at a, on a reality level. They know who he is and, and they have experienced him. And when they, when they write these songs, it's written from their heart. So let's don't write off the old songs. Uh, they're wonderful. And uh, I thank you for... Uh, Singing How Great Thou Art, that's one of the songs that in a choir in Hawaii that I learned to sing in Hawaiian. And the only part I remember is sing, it, uh, sing uh, the chorus in Hawaiian. And so I, I take the opportunity to do it. It brings back a lot of memories. When you get my age, you've got memories to keep you going. Uh, but we've watched over the years the number of people that just drifted off. And the work of God then is held up. Progress is minimized. Victory is something that you just hear about but you don't experience. And, the, and then failure is prominent all around us. We're promised the blessings will flow. And we are encouraged to taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, kind of try Him, you'll like Him. And we encourage each other over and over to keep your experience with God fresh and new and exciting. In verse 8 to 11 in chapter 34, we find these words. He says, This message came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah made a covenant with the people, proclaiming freedom for the slaves. He had ordered all the people to free their Hebrew slaves, both men and women. No one was to keep a fellow Judean in bondage. The officials and all the people had obeyed the king's command, but later they changed their minds. They took back the men and women they had freed, forcing them to be slaves again. Now apparently King Zedekiah had the word of the Lord at heart. You'll find this law in Deuteronomy chapter 15. And Zedekiah had the word of the Lord at his heart, and he took responsibility of leading the people in paths of righteousness. And not only were the slaves to be set free, their debts would to be canceled. They were commanded to, to give to those in needy, that are needy, and uh, give to those in need generously. And God's people are, we've discovered, if you allow this to sink into your heart, God's people are to be compassionate and giving and faithful. Uh, compassionate, and when you hit the word giving, it kind of tugs at your pocketbook. Over the years, we've seen people that have qualified their giving in some way so they could be spiritually stingy, I think. They have creative ways of tithing, and they don't consider the needs. They just, they just make sure that they don't give any more than they have to. And they'll find when you're, when you're, when you're giving is of that type, you'll find that your, your life is limited. Because the economy of God is built on giving. And it's giving from a compassionate heart. And when we give from a compassionate heart, when we touch the need of someone else by, uh, by our compassionate heart, a heart that God can share, when we give with that kind of motivation behind us, God can bless that. Someone once told me, he says, God loveth a cheerful giver, but he also receiveth from a grouch. And I don't know how true that is. Because I'm not sure God can relate to a grouch. 
Because God has asked his people to consider the needs and give uh, freely. Give freely to those that have need. Because God can't give to you if you can't give what God has given you already out. And somebody say, I can't get any more blessings. You can't get any blessings because you can't give out what God's already blessed you with. And they're to give without putting limits on what they give. And there's so many ways that we can be selfish and make sure that we take care of ourselves. <laughs> but God's Word tells us to esteem others higher than ourselves. Take note of the need of others and be generous in your giving to meet that need. You cannot reap any blessings from God until you get your thinking straightened out about giving and the motivation behind your giving. God set things down in man to live. For man to live, he gives us the directions on how to deal with life. And Zedekiah made a, made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to set their slaves free. And the officials and the people who entered into this covenant agreed to free their slaves and not hold them in bondage. They had agreed to that. Verse 10, it says, And the officials and all the people have obeyed the king's command. And they were responding to the call of leadership to be obedient to God's command. And I wonder this morning, or this evening, this afternoon, I'll figure out what part of the day we're in here. <laughs> Is it when we follow the Lord's command, when we have our pastors that, that uh, try to lead us in paths of righteousness, do we follow them or do we find ways of being resistant? We just finished a, a series uh, about with, uh, concerning spiritual leadership in our church. It took us 12 weeks to get through it. And it began to change the character of the church when people began to see the responsibility as a believer to be submissive to the leadership. And the leadership has the responsibility of knowing what God's commands are, knowing what God's direction are, and giving direction to the body of Christ. We run into a lot of uh, places where people uh, get spiritual and think they... They know that they need that what has to be done ahead of what the pastor's doing, and they try to take the church in that direction, and it causes great discomfort in the church. God's called us to be obedient to the leadership. Amen. Amen. Don't don't be afraid to be noisy now. You know, <laughs> uh, our, our our group gets a little rowdy once in a while, and they and they will shout, and they they'll have a good time, and, and when if, if they think if they believe what. I'm saying they'll shout amen at me. If they get quiet, I get worried. God has blessed me with five men that want to go into the ministry. Robert is, and I, I've never been in this place before. But So as, I, as I'm leading a church, now I'm looking, I've got five men that need to be led in ways and taught and prepared to step in and do the things I'm doing. That's a big challenge for me. And for the first time in 35 years of ministry, I'm looking at an opportunity to train someone for, for ministry. I must have done something right somewhere. Both we, My wife and I have two children. Our son's a pastor, and he was in Florida. Now he's in Hawaii. Our daughter was a missionary and a, a pastor in, in the islands of the Northern Marianas Islands, and, and she wound up her time in Rhoda. She's an administrator in a Christian school right now. I must have done something right. I want to tell you that if, if you learn how to be a follower and how to support and work with the leadership, God will bless you in turn. And, and we see these times and opportunities to, to be obedient and then you serve. And then when, when it comes your turn to step into that place, God can be there with you and bless your leadership. And then you'll find faithful followers that'll come alongside of you. I just thought of somebody else. I don't know why. I don't know if you met while she was here, uh, an old missionary to, to Japan, uh, Margaret Carlo. Did you know her? I packed that missionary up twice and sent her back to Japan. She uh, was an old friend of ours and had, had a very marked impact on our life. So the people responding to the, the call of leadership uh, uh, of Zedekiah to be obedient to God's commands. 
Now we're not told the occasion for making this covenant, but I'm sure it was a setting that encouraged people to follow the commandments of God. And we see similar situations in our services. Maybe we have an exciting service. Um, we, last Sunday we had a, a drama team at the church and they provided us some, some ministry that was very challenging to the people and we had a tremendous move of God and the altar uh, people at the altar we saw people that God just spoke to they just break into tears and began to weep before the Lord as the Holy Spirit began to move and and it was an exciting thing to to be there and I know there was commitments made that day it was great worship moving prayer powerful delivery from the, of the Word of God in such special ways and we are so moved by it and we go to the altar and seek God's forgiveness and we dedicate our hearts to Him. We have similar experiences. And then we go home and enter into a life devoted to God and suddenly somewhere down the line, maybe after a few days, we realize what giving our lives to Christ is all about. And we change our mind and we no longer serve or even obey Him in any way. It's kind of like after you have an emotional experience and, and great things at the altar with the Holy Spirit moving and, and then you get home and, and realize the change that's required in your life and it's kind of, oh, what have I done? And you begin to adjust things back to the way you used to be. Those in Zedekiah's day realized what they had done and they took all those people they had released and blessed and sent on their way. They went out and gathered them all back up and put them in bondage again. And they have then to do something like that. You not only have rebelled against God, but now you've rebelled against the leadership. And they have broken their covenants. I can, I'm not that old. Uh, but I can remember when, in, in the United States, when a man was counted on by, by just giving his word. And today, you not only have signatures that have to be witnessed, and, and, and a lawyer, it has to be a document prepared by a lawyer that nobody can read and understand, and, and, and even yet, they can find ways to break it. And I just, I'm just concerned because we approach Christ on that same kind of level. We make a deal, or we, we, we make a, a, build a relationship, and we think we can break it. I need to tell you this morning, God takes his commitments very seriously. And if you make a covenant with God, you need to keep that covenant. If you make a covenant with somebody, God holds you according to word that you keep pay your vows. You keep your covenant. If you cannot keep your covenant, you're not a trusted person. And we need to be taking these things serious. Too many people go to the altar, make a commitment to God, expect God to straighten up and fix their life, and, but they want to continue to live the way they live. They break the covenant. Verse 12 through 16. says, So the Lord gave this message through Jeremiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I made a covenant with your ancestors long ago when I was rescued when I rescued them from slavery in Egypt I told them that every Hebrew slave must be freed after serving six years but your ancestors paid no attention to me recently you repented and did what was right following my command you freed your slaves and made a Solomon covenant with me in the temple that bears my name but now you have shrugged off your oath and defiled my name by taking back the men and women you had freed, forcing them to be slaves once again. See, God does not let this go on without bringing it all out in the open. Um, I don't know. I don't know where we get this mentality that we can often do things and we can do it in secret and we can get away with it. And nobody knows anything about it. Uh, but I, I have found out over the years of my ministry is that if I try to do something in secret that's wrong, God has a way of making it public knowledge to everybody. And, and, and our, I can remember our son when he was entering the teenage stages and, and growing up that he would try things. He found out that he couldn't lie because every time he tried to lie, something would happen to point out the truth and he'd get found out. Uh, so we need to, 
uh, keep in mind that God has a way of bringing all of our shortcomings out in the open if we're trying to do things hidden. He tells the prophet Jeremiah, and of course Jeremiah raises his voice against them. How many times have you been in sin to go to church and only to find a pastor preach a message that gets right to the heart of the matter in your life? Makes you wonder how the preacher knew about your life. Maybe you think the preacher is exposing you to the whole church. And God still communicates with those he puts in leadership. And, it is, and I've had God, it is just a, it's an experience that I still wonder about today when God puts a message on my heart and, and, and I come up and I preach that message and, and somebody afterwards inevitably tells me, boy, that one was for me. They try to hide things in their life, but yet when they come into the presence of God, that God has a way of speaking direct to their hearts. Maybe you think the, that you're being exposed, but God is exposing your sin to you that he knows. And maybe we need to learn that. God sees and knows everything. We're not hiding anything from him. You might be able to hide it from your pastor. You might be able to hide it from the teacher. You might be hiding it from your neighbors. But you can't hide it from God. And that's God speaking to your heart when these things happen. He's calling for repentance. And, and don't hate the preacher or the evangelist or the one that, that speaks the truth. Know that God loves you and is calling you back into a walk with him. God reveals things to, to bring you into a place of repentance and righteousness. Please, please note here what it says in verse 16. It says, and, uh, But now you have shrugged off your oath and defiled my name by taking back the men and women you had freed. What he says in another verse, he says, But now you have turned around and profaned my name. And when we turn back into a life of sin and rebel against our covenant with God, we profane the name of God. Even the lost will look at you and make a joke out of Christianity. I don't know if you realize that or not. We have, they're the ones that bring reproach on the name of God. See, backsliding not only destroys your testimony, it drags the name of God down into the dirt with you. Now, verse 17. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, since you have not obeyed me by setting your countrymen free, he says, I will set you free to be destroyed by war, disease, and famine. You will be an object of horror to all the nations of the earth. There's one thing that we do not, that we're not free to do. We are free to choose, but we are not free to choose the consequences. And you need to get that concept going. You've got all these choices that you're faced with all the time. But they have consequences attached to them. And while you are free to make the choices that you have in life, God determines the consequences that you're going to pay. I remember a little sign that was in the bookstore in upstate New York where we lived. that It said, if you take without pay, pain, you'll pay when you're taken. As a reminder that God knows what you're doing anyhow. And a little twinge of the conscience there, that if you cross the line and take something, that God knows you got that. How many people we've run across that would, after years and years and years, would send back a letter and say how much they apologize for something, never hear from them again, but God had moved their heart, and they'd come and they'd apologize for something they'd done. God knows where they're at. God knows how to get into their lives and recall them. And a lot of them have suffered tremendous, terrible consequences in their life because they chose the path of action without completely understanding the consequences. And God has assigned those consequences. And when we step out from under God's hand, we are now subject to the consequences of our rebellion. And believe me, they're there. Did you ever wonder what the judgment of God was for us? He has us, he lets us have our own way, and we'll bring condemnation on ourselves. 
You remember that passage in the Bible that talks about Balaam and, and that donkey? And, and uh, the can't remember the guy's name now, but he had Balaam come to curse the children of God. And, he, and, he, and every time he opened his mouth, he blessed them. And it made the king mad because I call you up here to curse him, and all you do is bless him. He blessed them three times. And, and he, when he stood there and when he faced the children of God, he couldn't do anything except what God wanted him to. But afterwards, when he, when he got away from all the worship and all the stuff that was going on, he says, look, this is how you corrupt the children of God. This is how you destroy them. You send your women in amongst them and lead them astray. And they'll find themselves worshiping the gods and things like that. They will bring judgment on themselves. And we need to remember that. That when we defile ourselves, we are bringing, we just step out under the protection of God and the judgment of God comes because the things that we are involving ourselves in are the things that God is speaking against. The Bible says that we will reap what we sow. And there are consequences and we can't blame God for them. We can but blame ourselves. All of this brings me to the point of asking God some questions. Why the change of mind? Why do people come to the altar, sometimes in tears, asking God for forgiveness, telling Him they will serve Him? I've seen it all the time. I see people trying to make a deal with God at the altar. Oh Lord, if you'll save me and my family straight down, I'll serve you. Sometimes they last for a year and then they drift away back into their old life. I said, maybe they got bored with Christianity. I don't know. If you're, you need to have somebody stir up the gift that's within you. Because Christianity is not boredom. It's not a ritual. It's something that's to be involved in and something to do. Maybe God did deliver them from the circumstances that brought them to the church. Uh, people have dire circumstances in life. And, and experience tells me that one of the first places they go is the church. And, and they, they come in and they'll sit there and they'll weep great big tears. And, and they have a tragedy in their life. And I've learned to tell people when they come to the altar with that kind of experience in their life, I say, I want you to understand just because you get saved tonight does not guarantee that God is going to straighten out your life with all the problems that you've created. People want to come to church, have God fix things, and then they want to get back to their old way of life. God is interested in you coming to church and getting to know Him and leaving those things in His hands maybe. Maybe they expected something else than what they found. Maybe they expected an answer. Let me show you the answer. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, it says, Whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. Oh, I know, it's when you're going out places and you're getting involved in things and you're going and doing and stuff, there are going to come situations that you're confronted with. If you'll take time to wait on, on just pause for a minute, you'll hear the voice. Don't go there. Don't do that. And if we'll learn to trust that voice when it comes, it'll save us a lot of grief. But sometimes our ought-tos and our want-tos have conflicts. I found out that that's the only time that you have stress in, in the Christian life. is when you know what you should be doing, conflicts with what, <laughs> what you really want to do, you have stress. And the reason you have stress is because you're not totally committed to God. Because if you was committed to God, as soon as you found what you ought to do, that's the choice that you take. He says, I've said it before you, blessing and cursing, therefore choose the blessing. And we, we tend to want to choose the cursing. We're not too smart, are we? God says, choose the blessing. I tell people, he says, he gives you a test. It has one question on it. It only has two answers. It's either one or the other. And God loves you so much, he gives you the right answer. And we still choose the wrong one. Because we want to do things because we really like to do them. And I'm telling you, if that's your conflict and you're having that kind of stress in your life, then your life is not totally committed to God. John 13, 15 says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And what I hear the Word of God saying to us is, Jesus is not the answer. He's the pattern. When we find Christ and acknowledge what He has done for us, we have found more than 
our salvation. We found a new way of life and a new life to lead. It seems that most just want to have enough Jesus to straighten out the, the uh, struggles and their present difficulties and maybe keep them from hell. But he's so much more than that. He set an example for us to follow. And when we turn to Him in our crisis, we give in our greatest struggles to Him. When we can accept Him, we accept His way of life. He hardly ever gives us supernatural deliverance. But He does make supernatural use of all our troubles. I, I don't know. I find that pretty exciting. I, I find myself in situations that I, I don't even know how I get there sometimes. But God doesn't supernaturally deliver me, but he makes use, supernaturally, supernatural use of the difficulties that I give to him. In March 17th of 1999, we came out of the church. My wife and I spent four years in the Republic of Palau. We came out of the church and we had just finished building the mission house and we went home that night and as we walked in the house and got ready for bed and I said, I'm going to get some water and I went up into the kitchen I got a drink out of our, our cooler that was there and I, as I was doing this, I turned around and I looked into the, the living room through the sliding glass doors that separated our dining room from our living room and the couch was on fire. And an hour later, my wife and I are standing outside barefoot with only the clothes that we had. At that moment, in an hour's time, we lost everything we owned. Just us and the dog got out. And we watched in the next six months God take our tragedy and use that as, a, as, a, as an object to penetrate the hardness of the heart of the people of Palau that we were trying to minister to. Because they begin to see how God could intervene in a situation, how God could provide our needs, because it didn't cost us anything to rebuild the house. My wife and I were able to replace everything we lost except the personal stuff. You look at that and you go, wow! Isn't God good when He comes in the midst of a tragedy in your life and He uses that tragedy for His glory? God makes supernatural use of your problems and difficulties. So many scriptures point to this. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And until we realize that nothing is going to damage in our, change in our lives until we begin to change in the pattern that he gives us to live, we will continue to go from crisis to crisis, from failure to failure, from boredom to boredom. Until we get that place where we are at home with the life that Christ has given us to live. He is the way to live. The circumstances of our life are only the tools by which God shapes us into vessels of his choosing. I like going back to Jeremiah chapter 18. And he talks about that potter taking that clay and, and the things he does. There's a, there's a message in that how God works in our lives. How he applies the, the, the water to soften clay and make it smooth and that water's always been a, a type of the Holy Spirit so you can see God talking to us about how the Holy Spirit shapes our life and as the hand of God is working in our life he finds the dry places to work the moisture into sometimes he will break us completely down he will take that that vessel and he will just smash it down into a lump and start it all over again that's how God works in our life until we get to the place that we have accepted the way He wants us to live, we will continue to go through one cycle after another. Circumstances of our lives are the tools by which God shapes us into these vessels. He makes supernatural use of these events as He perfects the image of His Son Jesus in each of us. The greatest giants of the faith are those that suffered the most. And their testimony is, thank, is thankfulness to God for the work He's done in them. He that hath begun a good work in you is faithful to finish what He has started. If we continue in His Word and in His way. Let me ask you this afternoon, where are you in your walk with God? Are you confused, struggling, failing? 
I want you to know that God is here to bring you back into the fold and set you on the right path. God has never turned a deaf ear to someone that's cried unto him. And if we'll cry to him, he's ready to begin the work in you. Just as the potter in chapter 18 found the lump, so he breaks it all down and starts over working out those difficult spots until the vessel comes into perfection. See, perfection, not in our bodies, but perfection in your spirits. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we do enjoy your presence so much. And I pray, God, today that the pattern that was given us to live will not be a burden, but it will be a joy to walk after you and all your precepts and all your teachings, all your commands. Lord, not because we're bound by restriction, but Father, because we have a heart filled with love for you, the author and finisher of our faith. We pray that you'll continue to shape our lives through the events that we face until we come into the perfection of Jesus Christ in preparation for the call to spend an eternity with you. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory as we submit our lives to you this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, Pastor. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Gaither, for that word. Pastor Hiroshi, would you come on up and lead us in a final song? Shall we rise as we sing our final song together? I surrender, Lord. I surrender, Lord. Oh, to me, my blessing. Oh, to me. Thank you.